The missing submersible in the North Atlantic Ocean was destroyed in a, quote, catastrophic implosion. A tragic death of five people who died in a small submarine this week. You have to certify. You cannot take people down. It's irresponsible. The Ocean Gate disaster is now officially one of the worst tragedies in expedition history. How could a prestigious company with millions of dollars of backing, years of scientific research, and high profile clients cause one of the deadliest maritime disasters in history? Once the pressure vessel is, you're certain it's not going to collapse on everybody, everything else can fail. Your thrusters can go, your lights can go, you're still going to be safe. What went wrong with the company that was praised as being at the forefront of innovation? The story starts with one man, OceanGate co-founder and trust fund daredevil Stockton Rush. Rush was born into a wealthy family in San Francisco in 1962, and he was always poised for success. His father was a descendant of two signers of the Declaration of Independence, and his mother was a descendant of million-dollar giving philanthropists. This wealthy upbringing gave him plenty of time to chase his childhood dream of becoming an adventurer. Using his father's connections, Rush got his pilot's license in 1980 at just 18 years old, becoming one of the world's youngest commercial pilots. He flew chartered planes in and out of Saudi Arabia while studying aerospace engineering at Princeton. He designed a high-speed ultralight aircraft and built his own plane from a kit. Rush's addiction to pushing the limits started young and only escalated. After graduating, he worked as a flight test engineer for F-15 Eagle Jets before getting his MBA in business administration from UC Berkeley. He became a venture capitalist, using some of his family's vast funds to invest in tech startups and increasingly experimental inventions. Rush was a hobbyist scuba diver, and after his first trip in a submarine in 2006, he became obsessed with ocean exploration. He looked into purchasing a submersible, but couldn't, as he discovered that there were fewer than 100 privately owned submarines worldwide. Not one to be told no, he constructed his own miniature submarine, based on US Navy blueprints. Yet, he still wasn't satisfied. His sub could only dive 30 feet, and after failing again to find one for private purchase, he had a brilliant new idea to start an underwater exploration company, which would make it easier to get a sub to his liking. He saw the success of Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk in the space tourism industry, and thought that he could similarly create a significant market for oceanic tourism. With that idea in mind, Rush founded OceanGate in 2009 with business partner and former captain in the Marines, Guillermo Sonline. 2009. The Antipodes. The initial idea for Ocean Gate was to create a small fleet of five person commercial subs to be rented out for researchers or tourists. Their goal was to open the oceans for all of humanity. Their first sub was called the Antipodes, a used five person vessel with a steel hull. In their first four years, the company carried out over 100 dives with Antipodes to locations around the coastal US. Passengers typically paid between $7,500 and $40,000 per person per excursion, depending on the trip. To improve the tourist experience, Rush hired expert marine biologists to come along on each dive. This was a humble enough start, but with his background and daredevil designs, Rush decided to push Ocean Gate past what had been relatively leisurely joyrides. 2013. New Directions. In 2013, the company made a bold decision. Instead of relying on pre-existing tried and true subs, they were going to design their own. Their motive? To cut costs. That same year, Sunline left the company. He felt it was better to leave this engineering challenge up to Rush. Ocean Gate was now in uncharted waters. Their first custom-built submersible was the Cyclops One, built in collaboration with the University of Washington and Boeing. Initially, they planned to make the hull out of carbon fiber, a relatively untested material in underwater design. 
but instead acquired a cylindrical steel hull from an older sub. Oceangate revealed their new creation in 2005 and moved their headquarters to a more advantageous location in Washington State. Everything was going according to plan. But again, Rush was not satisfied with this small progress. He wanted the biggest prize in the underwater world, the Titanic. The Titanic's wreck sits on the ocean floor some 4,000 meters or 13,000 feet below the surface of the ocean. That's almost five times the height of the world's tallest building, the Burj Khalifa. Only a handful of specialized vessels exist that can reach those depths where pressure is 400 times greater than at sea level. That means 6,000 pounds of pressure per square inch enough to instantaneously crush any unprotected human. Rush wanted to do what those subs could do, but at a fraction of the cost. He began work on Ocean Gate's second sub, the Titan, but the engineering path to the bottom of the ocean proved difficult and was full of warning signs. The first such sign visible to the public came in 2018. Rush had hired a whole team of engineers to design this Titanic-bound sub with him, and in 2018, he fired one, David Lockridge, a pilot and director of marine operations for Oceangate at the time. Lockridge then sued the company, saying he had been fired for being a whistleblower and raising safety concerns. Its hull, the part where the passengers sit, is made from carbon fibre with titanium caps at each end. Carbon fibre is used in airplanes and yachts, but not for deep sea vessels. He repeatedly said that more testing was needed and alleged that he was not the only employee who feared the safety of the vessel. He was denied access to documents about the Titan specs he should have been able to see. Finally, in 2018, he was granted a meeting with Rush and his team. At the meeting, Lockridge discovered why he had been denied access to the viewport information from the engineering department. The viewpoint at the forward of the submersible was only built to a certified pressure of 1,300 meters. Although OceanGate intended to take passengers down to depths of 4,000 meters, OceanGate refused to pay for the manufacturer to build a viewport that would meet the required depth. Clearly, there were issues with the submersible that Rush knew about. So let's look at the overall design of the Titan. OceanGate's website claimed that the Titan was proven to be a safe and comfortable vessel that could withstand the enormous pressures of the deep ocean. But the facts say otherwise. The first problem with the Titan was the carbon fiber design. This material was chosen because it was lightweight and less expensive than the tried and true metals traditionally used to make submarines, like carbon steel, which the US Navy uses. While carbon steel has long been used within the aerospace industry, it has not been proven to repeatedly withstand the 6,000 pounds of deep sea pressure at the wreck of the Titanic. This carbon fiber design had never been used in this way before, and one crack or imperfection in the hull could doom the whole ship. Rush knew this. I'd like to be remembered as an innovator. I've broken some rules to make this. I think I've broken them with, with logic and good engineering behind me. The carbon fiber and titanium, there's a rule you don't do that. Well, I did. Only a years-long process of repeated dives, inspections, x-rays, and ultrasounds could have proved over time how resistant the carbon fiber was. But Rush wasn't interested in waiting around to clear the red tape. The second glaring issue with the sub is not as widely discussed, the fact that it is cylindrical. When it comes to deep sea exploration, most subs are actually spherical because that shape provides a more even distribution of pressure. All you have to do is look at the submersible that James Cameron took down to the bottom of the ocean to see the obvious differences between them. In a blog post from February 2019, OceanGate admitted that the Titan wasn't classed by an independent group that sets safety standards, as most chartered vessels are because its technology was so new and the company's innovation falls outside of the existing industry paradigm. 
it said there'd be a multi-year approval cycle due to a lack of pre-existing standards. Oceangate said that while classing has a safety value, it is not sufficient to ensure safety. And there were others in the industry who knew how dangerous it was. After Lockridge's lawsuit, multiple members of the Marine Technology Society worried that the company's experimental approach could result in negative outcomes, minor or catastrophic. Concerns were also raised by engineers from the Marine Technology Society over the experimental approach adopted by Oceangate that could result in negative outcomes from minor to catastrophic. But Rush would not budge. It was very clear that Oceangate was operating a submersible that was unsafe and that they had been warned on multiple occasions. But they went ahead anyway. And there was another problem with this particular trip. The terrible events of Sunday, June 18th wasn't the first time the sub had attempted to reach the Titanic. Twice previously, the Titan had gone down to the ocean floor. Both trips had been successes, and with tickets going at $250,000, it's no surprise they wanted these visits to continue. But as I mentioned earlier, carbon fiber was unproven. Perhaps it could withstand one or two trips under so much pressure. But what about three or four? Without the proper testing that Rush chose to bypass, there was no way to tell exactly how long the sub could last. The fact is, there were so many parts of the sub that were cheaply made to avoid costs. Rush wanted the ship to be as simple as possible, so that unknowing tourists couldn't accidentally hit a button and knock everything off course, but he did so by using an off-brand Xbox controller to pilot the ship. Some Navy subs had used similar controllers to operate periscope-like systems in the past, but they had never relied on one to actually maneuver a sub. Agreeing with me, and when we tried to ask Stockton questions, he kind of, uh, you know, brushed it off a little bit. So um, it's kind of red flags from the start. And then when the story came out... Another issue was the communication systems. Rush had done previous solo tests of the sub first at varying depths before attempting to go to the Titanic by himself. Reportedly, this first solo dive went according to plan until about 10,000 feet. Then the descent suddenly stopped. Rush deduced it was probably due to the density of the salt water which added buoyancy to the untested carbon fiber. But he didn't turn around. He instead used the external thrusters to dive even deeper. However, these thrusters interfered with the communication system and caused him to lose contact with the support crew. Eventually, he would make it down to the Titanic and back up to tell the tale, becoming only the second person to travel solo at that depth, the other being Titanic filmmaker James Cameron. Friday, June 16th. The plan for Titan's third trip was simple enough but they immediately ran into trouble. The ship carrying the sub set out from St. John's in Newfoundland, Canada on June 16th, 2023, and the weather was terrible. British billionaire Hamish Harding posted on his Facebook the next day, due to the worst winter in Newfoundland in 40 years, this mission is likely to be the first and only manned mission to the Titanic in 2023. A weather window has just opened up, and we're going to attempt to dive tomorrow. More expedition updates to follow, if the weather holds. This would be Harding's last post on Facebook. Sunday, June 18th. At 4am on Sunday, June 18th, 2023, the sub was supposed to start its descent to take advantage of the perfect conditions. The US Coast Guard reported that it did not start until four hours later at 8 a.m., but nobody is quite sure why. On board were five people. Stockton Rush as pilot, Paul-Henri Nargelet, a French specialist on the history of the Titanic, Hamish Harding, a British adventurer and aviation magnate, Shazada Dawood, a British billionaire businessman, and his 19-year-old son, Suleiman Dawood who was reportedly terrified to go down. 
Initially, everything seemed to be going fine for the two-hour descent down to the Titanic. But at around 9.45 a.m., the communication system and the tracking system between the sub and the surface cut off. The communication had gone down before, like on Rush's first solo journey to the sea floor, so no alarm bells were ringing yet. At almost 3,500 feet below the surface, a different story was unfolding. They were at 3,500 feet, they lost comms and tracking. The last one being the critical one, because the, the transponder that's used to track a sub during descent and on the bottom is a fully autonomous system. It's in its own pressure housing and it has its own battery power. So for them to lose comms and tracking at the same time, sub was gone. According to multiple accounts from the submersible community, the sub was equipped with sensors in the hull that would detect cracking and notify the passengers inside. Right before they lost communication and tracking, evidence shows the sub dropped their ascent weights and was attempting to ascend, trying to manage an emergency. As 3 p.m. rolled around, the scheduled return time for the sub, the Titan had failed to reappear. At 5.40 p.m., the Coast Guard received a report about the incident and the term used was overdue submersible. The next day, US and Canadian ships swarmed the area, dropping Sono buoys to monitor the depths. At the time, officials said that if the submersible is still intact, it would have between 70 and 96 hours of oxygen left. While there was substantial evidence of the sub imploding, the media latched on to the depleting air supply theory and it went viral. And so now we are at that critical moment when air may be running very low, if not already exhausted. A race against time very clearly as the oxygen supply on board dwindles. On the 20th, France joined the efforts to find the ship and the affair became an international operation, attracting media attention from all over the globe. Friends and family of the sub-occupants start giving testimonials on TV. On the 21st, the search continued as the oxygen clock ticked down. And at 2 a.m., the Coast Guard announced to the public that Canadian aircraft had detected underwater noises in the search area, and the news went into a frenzy, despite experts saying the sounds were most likely other ships in the area, and not the Titan. A Canadian plane picked up loud bangs on sonar in 30-minute increments. That's according to a memo sent to the Department of Homeland Security. And arriving tonight to that search site, a U.S. vessel that can recover large or bulky undersea objects, which is great news if those loud bangs materialize and everyone inside can be brought to terra firma. Crews searching for the sub reportedly heard today banging sounds at 30-minute Intervals. Banging sounds near the wreck of the Titanic. Underwater noises in the search area. Finally, on Thursday, June 22nd, hours after the deadline for oxygen ran out anyway, officials confirmed the finding of a debris field of the Titan. The sub had imploded on its journey down. Officials confirmed what a growing number of people already knew, that everyone inside had died instantaneously on the 18th during its initial descent. There was no hope of recovering the bodies. On June 28th, pieces from the wreckage were brought to the surface for the first time, giving insight into the tragedy. As of now, it is hard to say just what exactly went wrong with the sub. And there is a whole laundry list of items to choose from, whether it was the weakened carbon fiber hull, the underrated port, or the many other bargain store components, it's hard to say for sure.